Welcome to the second lecture in our series of lectures on the paperback revolution episode of the Machine That Changed the World documentary. This series is based on a documentary titled The Machine That Changed the World of 1992. It was written and directed by Nancy Lind and produced by WGBH Television of Boston, Massachusetts and the British Broadcasting Corporation. Backers included the Association for Computing Machinery, the National Science Foundation, and the Unisys Corporation. We ended our last lesson by listening to a presentation made by Dr. Ivan Sutherland. Another of the early pioneers is Dr. Doug Engelbart. Douglas C. Engelbart was a pioneer in the design of interactive computer environments, best known for inventing the computer mouse. Engelbart founded SRI International's Augmentation Research Center in Palo Alto, California, in an effort to further research information processing and computer sharing tools and methods. Before we're finished, you're going to hear more about the exciting events that took place in Palo Alto. In fact, why don't we talk about that right now? We heard Dr. Sutherland mention Xerox PARC. The PARC, by the way, stands for Palo Alto Research Center. We tend to think of Xerox as a copier company, but in fact, it has a history of extraordinary research in many types of technology, including computers. In the 1960s, they set up a research center in Palo Alto and populated it with many brilliant scientists who were allowed to explore research in human-computer interaction. At the time, using a computer meant learning many commands that could be input on a command line using a text-based interface. The learning curve was steep, and the command line interface really made computers difficult to use. It was not user-friendly, to say the least. The graphical user interface that most of us now use with our Windows and Mac machines can be attributed to that early research at Xerox PARC. According to legend, Steve Jobs of Apple took a tour of Xerox PARC and was so impressed with their work that he went back to Apple and informed everyone that the world of computer interface had changed which led to the beginning of their development of computers with a graphical user interface, ultimately leading to the Macintosh development. Xerox was the first company to produce a computer with a graphical user interface. It was called the Xerox Star. Apple's first computer with a graphical user interface was actually not the Macintosh, it was the Lisa. Now, as we move into the 1970s, we're introduced to the next major hardware development in the history of the computer, the microprocessor. Prior to that, the central processing unit actually consisted of a number of different physical components. There was a control unit, a component that decoded instructions and served as something of a dispatcher. It would input the instruction from secondary storage, decode the instruction, and based upon that, either perform some operation or direct another component to do so. Another component was the arithmetic logic unit, which performed arithmetic and logical operations, such as less than or greater than, etc. There were also several high-speed storage locations called registers. There were general purpose registers and also a special register called an instruction register for holding the address of the next instruction. It also included RAM, which stands for random access memory, the primary memory of a computer. The new processor combined the control unit the arithmetic logic unit, 
registers, and other circuitry on a single silicon chip. RAM remained a separate component. This small device replaced many large components that might have taken up much of an entire room and led to the entry of a whole new class of computers called the microcomputer. The microprocessor was invented by Intel under the leadership of Robert Noyce. Here is a picture of an early microprocessor, the Intel 4004, that included all those components that we just discussed. Here is a later version, the Intel 8080. A group of Intel employees branched off and started their own company, a Zilog, Z -I -L -O -G, which produced a competitor to this one called the Z80 that was used in a number of microcomputers that would be manufactured over the next few years. After the microprocessor was introduced, Popular Electronics Magazine put out a notice that if anyone could actually build a working computer using one of these devices, they would feature it as a cover story in their magazine. A graduate student named Ed Roberts accepted the challenge and built the machine that you see here, the Altair 8800. This was the first microcomputer ever built. Roberts went on to start a company called MITS, which sold the Altair 8800 as a kit. An interesting side note to this story is that MITS hired a couple of young guys who had started their own company called Microsoft. They were to make a basic interpreter for the new computer. Bill Gates and Paul Allen went on to great success with their Microsoft Corporation. We will end this video with the microprocessor. In the next video, we will learn about the wonderful new computers that started the whole microcomputer revolution, including this beauty, the Apple II. And a few years later, this one the IBM PC. Now let's take a break. Look over your notes and when you're ready come on back to the next conversation about the paperback revolution episode of the machine that changed the world.